May 23rd Committee of the Whole meeting. Uh, first, I'd like to start by welcoming us to the Squamish Nation Traditional Territory. Please be advised that this council meeting is being live streamed, recorded, and will be available to the public to view on the District of Squamish website following the meeting. If you have concerns, please notify the corporate officer present at the meeting. First, I will look for an adoption of the agenda. Councillor, I have to, yeah, Councillor French, sorry, I have to change my, my thinking to Councillor French, not John. Councillor, uh, Motion by Councillor French, seconded by uh, Mayor Herford. Um, all those in favor? Adoption, agenda adopted. Uh, first on our agenda, we have staff reports. Um, we have Sarah McJanet and Gabby Barnes giving us a staff report on the Squamish Valley Agriculture Plan and Squamish Food Policy Council update. Thank you very much. Good morning, Council and those joining uh, online. My name is Sarah McJanet, uh, planner with the planning department, and it's our pleasure to bring another annual update uh, forward in tandem with the Squamish Food Policy Council today on work on the agricultural plan, food systems initiatives, collaborations, and big achievements in 2022, as well as implementation priorities and work plan highlights for the 2023-2024 season. I wanna wish a warm welcome to SLRD Area D Director, Tony Rainbow, uh, here with us today, uh, who represents the Regional District in Squamish Valley. And we've been working together for over five years uh, in agricultural work. Um, which has been really exciting. And then with me here, we have Crystal Tenbrink, Executive Director with uh, Squamish Can, as well as Gabriella Leck, um, Food Systems Manager. And we also have other uh, staff uh, that have been very closely involved with food systems work in Squamish over the years. So uh, we've got our economic development team, uh, Kate Mulligan, and also uh, Gabrielle um, Barnes, and then also we have um, uh, Allison Westwood from Vancouver Coastal Health, so other collaborators. Um, and so uh, the report before you today is for information, no decisions, uh, just a celebration of work and the growing impact um, and in service to the food system and enhanced resiliency. So with that, I'll pass it over to Crystal and Gabriella. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having us. Uh, it's great to be here and nice to see you. Um, I thought I would give a little bit of a brief background for those of you that may not be familiar with sort of um, who we are and what the heck we've been up to. And um, so for myself, I work as the executive director and um, we've had, I'll just kick it off first, just to share a little bit about our supporters. We've had an amazing year, almost doubled revenue from the year before. And that is uh, only because of the hard work of our staff, but also um, because of all of these folks that have said yes. And um, so thank you to all of our funders in which you can see here. So um, the Squamish Valley Agriculture Plan got wrapped up in April of 2020, and it came to be where um, many groups came together, the Ministry of Agriculture, District of Squamish, and the Squamish Little Regional District, um, area D, we all came together to sort of develop a vision for what our food and agriculture system will look like in the next 10 years, and then worked through, um, developed a plan, came up with a small amount of 52 action items. And um, since then, we're now in our fourth year of implementing those action items um, and, and really feel like we've now taken a good chunk out of that plan, which is super exciting. Um, and so really the core of the, the objective is really to protect and increase the productivity of food lands in the agriculture land reserve and within different um, areas. Um, just so you're aware, because there is a connection, the Squamish Food Policy Council is a council that exists underneath of the backbone organization of the Squamish Climate Action Network. So um, yeah, next slide, thanks. So we'll kick it off with a little bit of a, a bit of a broad, how did we get to where we are? You can sort of see the establishment of Squamish Can, um, the uh, endorsement of the from the District of Squamish with the food charter, diving into uh, um, the Squamish 2040 OCP, and then from there, 
we were able to initiate the Squamish Valley Agriculture Plan in 2019 and wrap it up in 2020 and then just got to work right away. So um, you can see there's been some high priorities over the years that we've really targeted and been really focused on facilitating, having conversations, important conversations to get us to where we are now. Uh, <laughs> this is just the slide for 2022. It's been a really, it's been, it was a big year. Um, lots of revenue was generated, which is really exciting. Grants were um, allocated. Um, and I might just highlight, we're going to be going through a few of these, but I might just highlight uh, a few exciting, actually, I'm going to not highlight anything. I'll wait because we're going into it in a second. Now I'm going to highlight. So action 1.1 is uh, continuing to support and facilitate the land linking programs locally. And uh, we were able to host uh, with uh, with through the BC land matching program and young agrarians we had over 30 participants councillor French came out so thanks for joining um, and that was just a it's a great opportunity for landowners and farmers to connect and have convert facilitate a conversation to learn what does land leasing actually look like and um, we really feel that this is sort of a way forward in Squamish, given sort of the cost of land and the natural barriers that exist. And we currently, I believe these numbers have changed now, but we have about 12 to 14 land seekers that are registered with young agrarians and also about two to three land owners. And these can be smaller plots, as small as quarter acre and as large as 25 acres or bigger. So this is also Young Agrarians as a program um, that started in BC, but is now moving their way across the country, which is really exciting. Um, so as part of identifying opportunities for locations and enhancing land access for agriculture, um, it was a priority for us to figure out how we could um, secure land in Squamish or in SLRD um, for the future of farmers. And so we had quite a lot of farmers, in particular these three folks, Local Roots Farm Market, Fieldstone Garlic, and um, Aura Rosa Florals looking for land. Uh, we had had conversations for many over many years with the Easter Seals uh, camp. Um, and we're really excited to have broke ground a year ago. So we. Yeah, we're one year old now, uh, but if you haven't been yet, we're on the north end of the Easter Seals camp. One acre was secured and parsed out in one acre and two quarter acres. Um, I was there the other day and saw Vince attending to a 16,000 garlic cloves that he planted. <laughs> yeah, 16,000, and his rows are very straight. <laughs> um, I'm really excited to be able to announce that uh, Working with the Raven Drive townhome development, we were able to secure another half acre, which is sort of designed similar to this community farm model where Squamish can can have the lease help support farmers and leverage funding for common capital expenses and infrastructure, which we did at the Easter Seals project um, and also help set up the farm. So we're excited to work with Raven townhomes, Raven Drive townhomes, um, and there was 160,000 um, allocated towards the remuneration of um, fixing up that land and getting it ready with some of the higher costs of capital infrastructure pieces that farmers need that there isn't often a lot of funding for. So. So next, uh, if you, I mean, I don't know how you haven't seen the big greenhouse between the, <laughs> hopefully you have, uh, but we're really excited. We actually broke ground on both the community farm and the school farm project at the same time last year. Um, it was a great day and we were able to secure um, an, another five-year lease for a 12,000 square foot school farm between house on secondary and squamish elementary uh, we're super excited we, you know when we designed this we worked really closely with farm to school bc uh, who are sort of provincial leaders in helping support garden and farm programs within the schools uh, and when we started this the school their priority was that we could have hands-on learning in um, hands-on learning opportunities in the classroom and sort of out of the classroom. So they were really excited about this project. It took took no convincing on our part. Um, we had to find a location, work with operations. Sure, there's a lot of you know um, logistics in that, but we are 
uh, really excited and super proud to share that in the first term, we had 30 grade 10, 11, 12 sign up for the farm class. Um, and I wanted to just kind of share with you that uh, at the on the first day of the farm studies class, students were kind of like, mm, don't know, no one knew each other, no one was really friends. And by the end of it, uh, something that we saw and also heard directly from them was that it became their favorite class because they were, they all became like, they felt like they were part of a cohort. And so I think the, the sort of anecdotal evidence is there that the hands-on learning um, has had a huge contribution uh, with that. So just really excited to share. And this was a, um, we had fundraised over $250,000 in capital and operational costs and the school was able to financially contribute as well. So very exciting. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the Good Food Program is a pro uh, project of the Squamish Food Policy Council and identified as a priority action item uh, from the SFAP, which supports Action 2.4, support local procurement initiatives. Uh, the Good Food Program aims to shift buying power in the Squamish to Lillooet region towards procuring more locally grown food. So a highlight in November 2022, uh, we hosted our first Good Food Gathering series as a means to network and further identify barriers in the region to purchasing and selling locally grown food and as well to conduct a SWOT analysis with diverse players from across the region to identify next steps. So the first event was with farmers and restaurants. So we got all of them into a room and just um, facilitated the, this relationship building and just bonding over food. And it was really amazing to see. And you see in the picture there, um, that's an example of one of the relationships, a um, green olive identified uh, farm in Pemberton to source their potatoes. So that was really cool. And then the second event was for uh, institutions and policymakers, which I believe um, a few of you attended as well. Um, and that was also to see how institutions can procure more local food and get it into contracts. So by gathering at the same table, uh, these stakeholders were able to form new relationships and learn about the food system and begin to imagine together a future of food in our region. And uh, those are some of the top barriers identified in the SWOT analysis. Um, so things like access, volume, distribution, et cetera. Yeah. So the we were able to host a few educational far, workshops for farmers and agri-food businesses. Um, also, you know, thinking about gardeners, maybe encouraging them to giving them more skills to be able to sort of beef up their garden or um, maybe try to sway them into being small scale farmers secretly. That's what what we're thinking. Um, so we were able to host uh, some workshops on site at the school farm, really successful, really engaging conversations. In fact, people stayed two hours later at one of the workshops. So I think that just goes to when the, when the workshop is two hours and people stay two <laughs> hours longer, it's a good sign. So we also wanted just to highlight uh, that another area of the Squamish Valley Ag Plan uh, an objective is to increase agricultural awareness and education. So, uh, and there's some specific actions around engaging uh, the real estate and financial sector uh, in agricultural land use matters. So uh, last year in August, we uh, worked with the SLRD to update an ALR brochure uh, that's available um, for those that are considering buying or leasing agricultural land uh, within the region. And then in November, we had a really fantastic event uh, and big thanks to Councillor French and Mayor Herford for joining. Uh, so that was at the Squamish Public Library, where we hosted over 30 participants, uh, largely agriculture or largely uh, local realtors uh, in the Sea to Sky region. Uh, and so we had participation. It was a lunch and learn, uh, and we walked through agricultural land uh, regulation, providing a full context for um, uh, yeah land in the in the ALR and our objectives around food production. And um, we also partnered um, with the with agricultural uh, agrologists and land use planners with Agri BC as well as the Agricultural Land Commission uh, staff. So that was a, a really good relationship building and working um, with uh, those two agencies as well. 
Um, and the Squamish Food Policy Council uh, is also maintaining and further developing the regional food asset map, which has been promoted amongst regional partners like the um, District of Squamish and SLRD. Uh, so the top one there is uh, the 2022 Squamish to Lillooet regional food assets, and the bottom left are um, within DOS boundaries. So. In Squamish, the total number of recorded assets has grown each year since monitoring began. Um, 63 in 2018, 71 in 2019, uh, 80 in 2021, and in 2022, we rose again by six. Uh, the top three assets by type were food, retail, and markets, food growing, and schools. Um, so food growing assets can include a number of things like community gardens, um, schools, gardening programs, food businesses and apiaries. So uh, some of the food assets that grew were the downtown school farm, as well as the common acres community farm, which includes uh, three new farmers. So we continue just to support the wildlife risk reduction initiatives with agriculture stakeholders. So as uh, sessions are hosted, we're merely just helping get the word out and encouraging people to attend. Um, and we'll continue to do that. So we're not directly organizing or hosting, um, but when the province hosts, we'll share. And for action item 2.1, develop an agri-food sector strategy for the Squamish Valley. Um, we are currently amidst a food and farm hub feasibility plan partnered with the economic development team at the district of Squamish. And the goal of this feasibility work is to understand under what circumstances and with what components a food and farm hub could work in Squamish. So a farm hub is defined as a network of food and farm infrastructure within a region to strengthen the area's local food economy. So it would involve the collaboration of farmers, organizations, and consumers to aggregate and distribute resources to make food available in a given area. So, um, like I said, we've been uh, doing this study and talking to a lot of existing food hubs around BC and Canada and the US and trying to identify uh, challenges they've faced, how they chose their model, and um, just trying to identify best practices to determine what model would be best in our region. Oh, okay. Did you? Okay. Uh, and many of you were here for this, but the UBCM, uh, we were able to host the UBCM farm tour the, in 2022, which was really exciting. Uh, we had over 80 participants out. And I also co presented with Investment Agriculture Foundation and Farm Folk, City Folk, a session about food systems, climate action, local government. It was really well received, and I'm hoping to host a workshop. Uh, perhaps for 2023. So you may see me there again. And so a few plans um, we're going to, well, you can see here, we've, uh, <laughs> there's there's lots of plans, lots of actions. Um, you want me to go through all this? <laughs> I think it's, it's very well detailed in the yeah. report. So yeah, we'll probably just okay. zoom we'll through and, and go to an exciting slide next, I think, which is this one. <laughs> So funding, in, uh, you can see at the very bottom on the left that we were um, sort of the, the growth that we've had and last year was um, quite a significant growth. Um, really thankful for, to all the funders that really uh, helped step up. The We have some confirmed funding to share for 2023 since we're already a few months in. Um, one of which is gaming grant. Uh, another highlight would be the Vancouver Foundation to support the ongoing development of the Good Food Program, but also um, the Red Up funding, uh, which we presented on a few months ago with the economic development team and uh, really super exciting that the, that the district was awarded three of those grants, all of them. <laughs> I know there was some question marks when we first uh, <laughs> came forward, but nonetheless, we, we received it and it is a, a project funded over two years. So we look forward to keeping you updated next year. And then there's lots of other plans. Um, so in terms of just ongoing, you know, when we're, we're doing this work, it's been four years. Um, we're also looking at how do we sustain this work because we know that the importance of it is not going away. In fact, it's only growing. And so wanted to just um, just put out there to you folks that uh, there may be some options for exploring uh, and we've 
through perhaps local services and things. Um, we don't have to have this conversation today, but wanted to just put that question out. How do we sustain the ongoing um, need and demand of local food and regional food? Um, yeah. And the last thing is probably just always thinking about as future developments come forward, how might we put parcels into production? Is there opportunities? And so always thinking about how we might be able to jump into a conversation and see if there's a synergy there with a future development or um, some change happening. We are always participating in the neighborhood plans as much as we can. And so we'll continue to do so to help steer the vision forward and advocate for the priorities in the agriculture plan. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, we will welcome any questions or comments and uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Council, questions? Mayor Herford? Hello, um, thank you so much for the, well, all the work that was summed up in the present in the presentation. Um, and I know that's really just scratching the surface. Um, I really enjoyed the session um, that I attended with the realtors around the lunch, lunch and learn around the ALR land. And I wondered if there is plans to have that happen sort of on an ongoing basis. I know that we didn't, Clearly, not every realtor in town was there, and you know we often do run into landowners that aren't aware of what it is that they own, and um, it feels like a, a gap that uh, that's important. Are there plans for um, for an additional session or ongoing? Thank you, through the chair. We don't currently have plans to rerun that session at this time. However, uh, we'd be very open to that. We have, um, in the follow up to that event, we provided the presentation to the realtor group, and also it's on the SLRD website. And then there's the brochure. So, um, yeah, that that was a, a fantastic event, and it, we we held it on the heels of a really successful preceding event with the real with local realtors on short-term rentals. So uh, they really enjoyed it. There was a lot of feedback. And so I think there are probably quite a few topics that we could bring forward, but we will definitely consider maybe rerunning the agricultural one. Thank you. Councillor Stoner. Thank you through the chair. A uh, huge thanks for the update and all the work that you do in our community. Um, a few questions. Uh, I'm curious if we have any success stories for the land linking program. So I know that there's quite a few folks who are listed there as looking for land and two to three folks who have lands up for grabs. Have we actually seen any matches made in heaven? Yeah, so a few, well, a few years ago, young agrarians had worked with a land owner in the Squamish Valley and um, Nutrient Dense Farms has secured a long-term lease. So that's one. And then we did work with the three farms. They all have five-year sub or licenses with us. So there's three farms there. There's nothing else yet. I think, um, you know, the sort of what I gather is, you know, for a match to happen, it requires, it's, it's like dating. <laughs> it really requires a lot of investment and good conversation and making sure that it's a good fit. There are a few folks within the District of Squamish that I am following up with who have expressed uh, interest and then it's a matter of finding someone who's ready and keen to get in there and start growing food or whatever it is they might be growing yeah yeah that's helpful I know it's not necessarily an easy match to make but I think it leads to my second question which is I'm curious if the Squamish Food Policy Council or through the Squamish Valley Agricultural Plan We've done like some deeper thinking on how we actually incentivize getting more of our ALL or land into production so part of that is like some of these pieces around the realtor education and outreach. Have we done a deep dive on like, how can we actually either through the district of Squamish or the SLRD, how do like, what are the avenues that we have to actually incentivize people getting land into production? Thank you for the question uh, through the chair. Uh, we that's an area that we can do more work in for sure in terms of a uh, deeper dive um, to really try and maybe not incentivize, but like, you know, encourage um, this food policy council has done a lot of work with new entrants as well in terms of helping to support uh, new farmers 
you know, developing the skill base, going, understanding where the funding is in, in order to, um, uh, get up and running and then also to address barriers and it's been really around providing resources uh, for the most part um, as opposed to incentives per se um, but that's an area that we would be yeah pleased to kind of continue to work together on and crystal do you have any other insights yeah i'll just add that i think um strengthening uh policy within your own respective community government or within your own local government would be a great way to do that. And I might also reach out through your connections uh, across the province to see what who's done a great job of this. And if there's um, if there's a gap or an avenue you think that we might be able to help out with, definitely let us know. And we also have um, we're connected with folks who do what we do across the province as well and beyond. So happy to reach out. Thanks very much. I've got Councillor Pettingill next. Thanks. Uh, all kinds of really happy and exciting stuff. Uh, it's a good, I guess, setup for the rest of today, which might be tougher, but <laughs> these are really positive things to to hear about. Thank you. Um, one thing that uh, I wanted to sort, and maybe this is a, a whole conversation onto itself for another day, but uh, it, it seems um, that there's more viability on a smaller scale right now, and it sometimes requires a lot of support and CACs and so on, and, and we've kind of figured out you know, with a lot of innovation, how to make some of those things work. Um, with bigger lots and ALR, uh, there is, I hear pressure from some folks to be able to subdivide so we can put it into production now, but I also hear, well, actually, no, it's okay that it's non-productive right now, that the economics aren't there, and it's better to leave those as large parcels because we're gonna desperately need those in the future. And so we shouldn't be driving to subdivide and put those into production. I'm just wondering if we're doing work on that or where that conversation stands or what the current thoughts are on that sort of that tension. Uh, thank you for the question and the comment just around the issue of subdivision and land size. And certainly uh, at the uh, event that we held with local realtors, Ministry of Agriculture and the ALC were very clear with um, with. Uh, the community around the the challenges and the that subdivision is not the friend of, of food production um, and that there's very strong um, um, regulation around subdivision and that um, there's other ways to help support kind of new entrants and kind of scaling up um, but there is a hard line around subdivision for sure and so that we were able to to speak more to that um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll stop there. I'll Crystal. just add, and this is what I learned also from the Ministry of Agriculture when they presented at that event. Um, if you folks may have remember, if you the when you take large parcels, statistically, as soon as you subdivide them, regardless of the size, the st the stats on them actually staying in production or even being put in production is really low. And with young agrarians offering a free leasing and land linking service, in my opinion, and in many people's opinions, there's sort of no excuse to subdivide. There are other ways to get land into production, which is through leasing. And these are being, these have been true, tried and tested. So I think that model's great. I think um, what's hard is housing farmers is a really big issue. And a farmer may want, may not want to farm on land if they can't live there. So that's also another thing to consider is might there be some opportunities for um, small housing opportunities, you know, as we put land in production will need to be a priority. And I know Young Agrarians is strongly advocating for that as well, strong messaging across the country. Ho hopefully that helps. Thanks very much. Next, we've got Councillor Greenlaw and then Councillor Anderson. Thanks. Uh, through the chair, you were mentioning some of the barriers to buying and selling uh, locally grown food. And I was wondering, this is just like a fantasy of mine. Have you guys considered the plant tech store as a location for like a local market? Yeah, I can say that right now we're not in the stage of trying to find a location. We're at the early stages of doing research to understand what are some of those best practices and sustainable models of food and farm hubs so we can not reinvent, 
so we can reinvent the good wheel, not the bad one, and um, and then design and develop something that will work within our community and in, including in the region. And there's some really exciting things that we're learning about how regionally this is working as well. When um, there's a great example in Tahoe with a uh, um, in in one area, there's a, a port uh, like a shipping container cooler, and then the food hub comes and picks it up once a week from the farmers and anyway there's just some really great models but we're not there yet um but we're 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 working on it baby steps yeah the, the a food hub can look differently in every region so we're trying to figure out what does it look like in our region is it a commissary kitchen um cold storage refrigeration units uh distribution uh services um yeah it can look like a lot of different things and we're trying to figure out what those things are and also what kind of model would sustain those things. Is it nonprofit? Is it for profit? Is it co op? So that's what we're investigating at the moment. Thanks. Thanks. And now we've got Councillor Anderson. Thank you, Chair. In the uh, report to Council, uh, ser local service area bylaw is uh, highlighted as an opportunity or scenario for raising funds to support future food, food systems work. And there's also an SLRD motion referenced uh, from January 2022 um, promoting this. Are you aware of other examples of local governments around BC implementing such a local service area bylaw for this purpose? I can share with my limited knowledge. No. Okay, <laughs> I can share with my limited. Oh, Councillor Stoner, do you? <laughs> I know that the village of Lillooet, with the SLRD, has a uh, motion forward to develop something like this. I believe that it is through not a not a food system lens, but rather through an economic development lens, and I believe that it is not executed yet. Um, but I think that there are, um, this is something that we can explore a little bit more because I, I think as we look to other communities, we're hoping to lean on what they've learned. But I think, to be honest, we might be one of the first ones actually doing this, which is also exciting and hopefully will pave the way for how we fund food systems on a local level in the future. Thank you. Um, when the Squamish Valley Agricultural Plan was being undertaken, I recall here in Council Chambers, we discussed um, um, the opportunity to highlight agroforestry, a, a large field, different practices in coming under that, as uh, something deserving attention in the plan. And uh, this was a um, reference in the plan. Um, I wonder, uh, and Councillor Stoner has referred to the agricultural land that is not in production, and a very substantial part of that is under tree cover, and also other lands not in the ALR under tree cover that have potential. I wondered if you have uh, appetite or capacity to explore this field, or whether in your travels you've come across partners or potential potentially interested people to explore agroforestry. I'm aware a few years ago, the Ministry of Agriculture put substantial attention into an extension program for agroforestry practices. Has this come up in your travels the last couple of years? Not since you were on our board. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, to be honest, not recently, but I do know that agroforestry is uh has been i've heard it in more conver there's been more conversation about it for sure and i think that there's some great synergies with sort of um just warm general warming and um climate action and uh regenerative models of agriculture so i think that agroforestry can play a really important role in the future so perhaps if you have some resources or i can explore some i think it's worth exploring for sure thanks Thanks. And one last quick question from Councillor French. Quick it shall be. Um, thanks for the update. And with the success of um, the school farmyard, I'm wondering if there has been any talk or thought of replicating that success between Don Ross and Brackendale Elementary, because because you're not busy enough already. <laughs> yeah, that's true. My to do list is getting small. It's only three pages. So. Um, we have been in conversation. Don Ross has a small garden, a small courtyard garden uh, that the pack had built, and we've been sort of helping support it a bit. I mean, 
the past leadership has been excited to explore this as uh, a next project moving forward. We haven't gotten serious and had a conversation, but I think everyone seems fairly open, especially given the experiences and uh, that students and uh, teachers are having uh, with the school farm, which, by the way, has 60 students registered next year, 30 in each semester. So we're full now. <laughs> Yeah, it's great. So I think I think words getting out either we're cool or they just like eating food. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. Oh, yes. Tony Rainbow. Yes. Come I just on. wanted to say thank you very much for inviting me um, today and <clears throat> just make the comment that I, I think this this um, program, shall I call it, the cooperation between the SLRD and the district. I think it's a great example of, of um, using our resources cooperatively to a, um, you know, a good end. And I know that we have staff involved as well. Claire, Claire Dewar is um, with us, but she, she works on this. And uh, the, the, the question of um, a local service area that involves the district and parts of it wouldn't be the whole of area D, but parts of area D. I think that's something we definitely need to uh, pursue and consider. So thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you. And we'll just take a brief moment while we switch over. All right, thanks very much. We'll get started again. Next, we have the uh, active transportation update with uh, transportation planner Dora Gunn, and I believe Jesse Moorwood is online. Thank you. Thank you, and good morning, uh, Mayor and Council. I'm Dora Gunn, a transportation planner with the District of Squamish. And on the phone today, we have Jesse Moorwood, Capital Projects Manager, also with the district. Uh, he's available to answer questions. Um, today, I'm providing an update on active transportation infrastructure projects. Uh, so the purpose of the presentation is to provide an overview of the active transportation capital project planning process, an update on the status of infrastructure projects in the active transportation plan, and a summary of upcoming large projects. So the district completed an active transportation plan in 2016. It provides recommendations in a number of areas, including infrastructure projects, maintenance, education, and enforcement. Uh, the district also completed eight school travel plans between 2015 and 2021. These provide sort of a finer grained and smaller scale set of recommendations than the active transportation plan. Uh, the district has an annual capital budget uh, allocated to active transportation. Currently it's set at 800,000. And it's funded from the Community Works Fund, which is a federal gas tax program. Every year, staff do look for other sources of funding to augment the space amount. Um, additional sources can include grants, development cost charges, uh, cash in lieu, and community amenity contributions. So we're primarily focused on capital projects in this presentation, but active transportation upgrades do get completed through development as well. Um, that can be through funnage improvements uh, for uh, projects that are directly adjacent, and it can also be um, through community amenity contributions of actually built projects. Okay, moving on to planning and prioritization. Uh, so we can roughly divide active transportation projects into two groups, small and large. Uh, small projects address localized issues. They're lower cost. They have shorter timelines. An example of that would be something like the pedestrian flashing beacons on the right-hand photo up there. And then larger projects are more complex, higher budget, longer lead time. These can take anywhere from uh, one year to three or more years to plan for before we get to construction. And after the uh, active transportation plan was completed in 2016 and we had done some work on the school travel plans, uh, the main focus at that time was on some of the smaller projects. There was a lot of low hanging fruit areas where we could create some of these connections and really make some improvements with the smaller projects. Over time, we've completed a lot of those. There are still more, but we have shifted towards working on more of the bigger projects now. And you can see some of those, for example, the Pemberton Avenue bike lanes uh, in the picture up there, as well as the um, sidewalk and protected bike lane on Mamquam west of the highway. And we are continuing to work on these bigger projects now. Uh, so 
Um, the active transportation plan provides some high level guidance on priorities through the short, medium and long term designation. The process for that prioritization wasn't overly complex uh, for sidewalks. It was based on creating new facilities to demand areas. So that's areas like commercial or schools, uh, filling in gaps and enhancing safety. And then for bike facilities, it was based on proximity to downtown as well as other commercial and community destinations. But there's quite a number of other considerations that were not captured in the active transportation plan that we have to consider as we're going through this process. So those are all listed in the box on the slide. I will briefly mention them, but we can come back to them later. Uh, so other considerations are higher level planning processes. So sometimes we're doing a corridor level plan or a neighborhood plan. Sometimes those need to finish before we can start implementing some of the projects within those areas. Um, coordination with other capital projects, which can either um, bump a project up, so make it happen faster than we might otherwise have done it, or slow it down too, just to try and coordinate. Uh, sometimes there are environmental issues, uh, the cost of projects, as well as the funding opportunities. Some projects fit better within certain funding envelopes than others. Uh, the road classification can be a determinant. Um, Sometimes with uh, major collectors, if there's speeding issues, we, we might not use some of the other traffic calming measures that we might use on a minor collector or a local road. So we're, we have to do something like sidewalks and bike lanes to, uh, to uh, increase safety. Uh, development projects, uh, for example, sometimes if we know that a project is coming up in the near term, we might hold off on the capital program and not build a project through capital, knowing that it might get built through development. I mentioned already the active and safe routes to school and then also community feedback. So the result of all these is that sometimes projects that were initially identified as um, medium or long-term projects in the active transportation plan, they can end up as short-term projects. Okay, uh, so moving on now to the status of uh, infrastructure projects in the active transportation plan. So I have two slides, one for sidewalks and one for bike projects. Um, in these charts, uh, we are looking at both capital capital built projects and development built projects. Um, the numbers don't include the government road corridor, the discovery trail or the corridor trail um, because these were broken out differently in the active transportation plan. Um, so the first uh, chart there shows short term sidewalk projects and you can see that 79% of those are complete or in process. For medium term sidewalk projects, we have 12% complete, uh, sorry, 12% in process. And then for long term, we have 20%. Um, and looking at those medium and long term ones that are in process, about two thirds of those are due to development projects or synergies with other capital projects. So that's why they're underway kind of ahead of time. And then there's one third that actually were initiated through the capital program. Um, and in this case, that's actually two projects. Um, one of them is Perth. The other one is Westway, and we'll talk about those more later. Moving on to the bike projects. Um, so for short term, you can see 60% are complete or in process. Medium term, 37% complete or in process, and then 31% um, for long term. And similar to the sidewalk projects um, of the ones that are moving ahead in the medium and long term, kind of ahead of schedule, two thirds of those again are due to development or synergies with other capital projects, and one third is due to projects that we actually chose to initiate. Um, and in this case, there's four of those that we chose to initiate. Uh, Victoria Street bike lanes, which we'll talk about in a sec, um, Westway bike lanes, and Perth Drive bike lanes, which is only a design, not a, not a construction at this point, um, as well as the Northridge Vista neighborhood way, which is complete. Okay, so moving on now to upcoming projects. Um, this first slide shows three projects that were anticipated to build in 2023 or early 2024. Uh, the Discovery Trail project is a short missing section near the affordable housing um, project. It will complete the trail from downtown to the industrial park um, and it's a route to school. Perth Drive is a uh, sidewalk on the west side of Perth. Um, it will maintain the environmentally sensitive ditch there. It goes from the boulevard to Pia. Um, Perth is a major collector with ongoing speeding complaints. It's a route to school and it was identified as a priority through public consultation. Uh, Highlands Way South um, is a third one. It's a major collector um, identified as a top priority at the public cycling infrastructure workshop, which was held in 2019. 
Um, it's also an important missing connection. And here we're looking to build an uphill bike lane um, on the uphill side. Okay, for the next set of projects um, anticipated to be complete in 2024 or 2025, we have uh, protected bike lanes on Victoria Street from Loggers to 3rd. We've discussed these with Council fairly recently, and there was an interest in having these completed on a similar time frame as the new bridge, which is currently anticipated to be complete in August 2024. Um, this will provide a safe cycling connection to downtown. Um, and also, there are some interesting challenges related to the timing of some development projects on Victoria. So there's a bit of a rationale for continuing to progress this project forward due to that. Um, and then Depot Road, so the first phase of this project um, uh, would be to create a sidewalk and bike lane, um, ideally all along one side, so we can connect all the way from Government Road to the highway. We're not entirely sure how the phasing will work exactly for this project because we haven't done a concept for this yet. We're going straight into detailed design on this project. Um, and lastly, coming up for 2024, sorry, 2025, 26, we have Third Avenue. So sidewalks and protected bike lanes from Bailey to Vancouver is the goal here. Uh, it will be phased. The first phase will likely be um, from Bailey to Victoria. That's the goal. Um, it will, that exact distance will be determined by cost and funding as we get closer. Um, third is an important downtown cycling route and a transit route as well as just being a very busy street. Um, and it will link to some projects that are being built by developers in the same stretch. And then lastly, we have Westway. Um, it's on the list. We are working on a concept design. We don't have a date for construction yet. Uh, the value of having a concept at this stage is that it can inform frontages if we have uh, development projects coming up on Westway. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Finally, um, for the budget, uh, all the 2023 projects are already in the 2023 to 2027 five-year financial plan. The future's, future year's projects will depend on budget availability. I mentioned before that many of the projects are funded through the Community Works Fund, which does expire in March 2024. But we understand there are discussions underway to renew that. So we hope that will happen. If not, we'll have to look for other sources of funding, which could affect the, the timelines that we discussed today. And that is it for my presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much. Council. Questions? Councilor Penningill? Yeah, thanks. Uh, and really appreciate the trails. I'm using them regularly. So uh, uh, a lot more than the, the real mountain bike trails, <laughs> the commuter trail and so on gets a, a lot of use for me. So yeah, thank you for, for all the work that's being done there. Um, a couple questions. So the, I, I can't remember what the name of the uh, exercise, the engagement was called, but um, you know, people as as trails have changed and grown, people are using more bikes, maybe their perspectives on what's more impo most important has changed. What's the feedback mechanism for the public if they'd say, hey, I'd really appreciate a trail here, or I would appreciate a reprioritization? What, what, how do we, how does the public feed into that? So we welcome complaints from the public through the website, through email, through phone calls at any point, at some point, we do plan to go back to the public and do a bit of an update on this plan. Uh, to date, we have been working still to get through the short term projects. And so it felt like we still had so much work to do that it didn't make sense to go back to the public yet. But that will come in the not too far distant future. Okay, thanks. And I'll just maybe because with the, the Highlands Way uh, and Perth work and so on, my perspective would be fantastic to have two lanes along Mamquam on the south side the whole way. Um, so just put that in the, in the personal, uh, but uh, one of the other things I, I do hear about is for the lanes and so on, we do have issues with parking a little bit, but more garbage and recycling bins. I know we've heard that the arms can reach quite far out, but if you don't put it in the bike lane, then you're putting on the sidewalk. And then if you don't put it on the sidewalk, then it maybe is too far. So I'm wondering if, um, you know, how or where we manage education and enforcement is that part of this planning and funding or is that something separate and you know do we or should we be considering in driveway design or something something where you can get in and out so you're not parking your car in the bike lane while you're moving your bins around into your driveway so the bins are in the driveway and blah 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 like is this an area where uh we we're putting any thought or could we be doing something there uh, through the chair, so we have thought quite a bit about the garbage bin issue. I haven't thought about alternative driveway design 
aspect of that yet, though. That's a good question. Um, uh, regarding education, though, we are planning to have um, on the uh, uh, when their waste audits are done and the little hangers get put on people's bins, um, we're going to have an education piece on that starting with the next round of printing of those tags um, to remind people about that. We have done some limited education on it in the past, so social media, chief, that kind of thing, but it, I don't, it's not been enough. It's not been effective yet. So we're hoping that those tags with the information may help. Councillor Anderson. Thank you. I, um, Ms. Gunn, I appreciate your account of, of the, especially appreciate your account of the active transportation plan as a plan that's adaptive and that we learn as we go and we can uh, move long-term projects or rearrange priorities. And this relates to my question. Uh, Valley Cliff and Hospital Hill are without a safe, convenient pedestrian route to downtown and three schools in the downtown area. When I was representing Squamish Can in the stakeholder meetings to create this plan, this is back in 2015, 2016, um, this particular issue, and it is the steep slope is the issue, was uh, it was not going to be included in the plan. And I, I guess we assumed at the time it was going to be looked after in the land development agreement of the Scott Crescent development. That development, uh, land development agreement, at least the addition that I have of it uh, that's public, involves investment of $100,000 into that trail at phase four of that development. Now that land development agreement may have some things going on and, and behind the scenes or uh, adjustments to it, but that's the way it stands. The property uh, was acquired with, with this problem steep slope was acquired from the Hunter family in 2012 for, and I quote, the purpose of bringing people safely through the newly acquired property. And that's in the council motion behind that acquisition. Uh, it is the issue of this steep, steep section of the trail, which has become more and more uh, risky for users, uh, has been highlighted in feedback to the transportation master plan. And that plan is referenced in your report. Councillor Greenlaw and I have uh, attended to this setting with representatives of uh, Squamish Trail Society and SORCA. They are well aware of this issue and prepared to offer technical advice or even volunteer help if need be. I guess it's a, it's a complicated puzzle because of the tie-in with the Scott Crescent development and plans around there. But I wonder, um, recognizing it's a complicated picture, can this issue be given attention in um, forthcoming work uh, in connection with either the active transportation plan or hopefully, if it will come soon, through the transportation master plan process? Thank you. Uh, through the chair. So yes, that trail has been on the radar for a long time. Uh, we have the $100,000 in the LDA with Redbridge, um, the timing of that. So it's tied to phase the completion of phase four, which is currently anticipated to be fall 2025. Uh, so we will be starting to plan for that project as we approach that timeline. Conceivably, we could anticipate the money may arrive in 2025. So that's the time we might, we might be looking for for that project. Um, as you mentioned, there are conversations ongoing currently about the LDA, so maybe there are opportunities for change. I can't speak to that at this point, but perhaps. Thank you very much. Thanks, and Councillor Greenlaw. Thanks, uh, through the chair. Thank you so much for this presentation. I personally appreciate um, all the expansion of the trail networks. We try to use them as much as we can. I really enjoy active transportation. And I was wondering if there are plans for other kinds of support for our active transportation networks, like um, are there plans for increasing bike parking downtown? Is that kind of on the agenda or like safe parking for the increasingly expensive bikes that are that are being used for transit? Um, and also um, prioritizing snow removal for trails, trail networks uh, in the wintertime to ensure that active transportation is all year round feasible. Through the chair. Um, so for bike parking downtown, uh, that is uh, considered through, if we're talking about inside buildings, that's considered through the development process. And we definitely look at all the bike rooms and there's requirements for those. Um, bike racks outside, like on the street, is something that we haven't spent a lot of time. We don't have a, an inventory of where those all are. Now, some of them are on our road right away and some of them are on private property. So it's a bit like it would be a lot of work to create an inventory and plus all the ones that are not on our property are liable to change at any moment. And it, so then maintaining that inventory is a bit tricky, which is why we haven't done it yet. But 
it's probably a good idea to do that at some point and just see where our gaps are, particularly downtown. And there was a third part of your question. Apologize. Snow removal. Ah, snow removal. Thank you. Um, so uh, Public Works does prioritize uh, snow removal on certain routes, particularly routes to school already for uh, active transportation routes like bike paths and bike lanes. Um, if there are concerns about where their prioritization is, then feel free to let me know. I can work on that. Thanks. Oh, um, actually, I have one other um, quite well, I have a couple other questions, but this is the other one I'll use right now. Um, we've uh, we've been getting some as like, you know, more people are cycling and we want more people cycling. We want more people in active transportation, but there can be a bit of a conflict between like um, on multi use trails between like walkers and cyclists. Right. And I was wondering if the municipality is doing anything about kind of, I don't know, increasing signage or increasing um, awareness about kind of good cycling etiquette, you know, like making a noise when you're passing a pedestrian kind of thing. So you don't scare them, not speeding down multi-use trails and stuff like that. Thanks. To the chair, um, thank you for that question. So we actually have a consultant helping us right now uh, to look into that question. What we were wondering is what our jurisdiction is as far as regulating these speeds and types of users on these trails. So the consultant is looking into that question right now. Once we have the answer to that, we will be working on uh, some education, which could be in the form of signage as well as social media posts and that kind of thing to try and make sure that we're having the right um, types of users that maintain a safe environment on those trails. So it's underway. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Next we have Mayor Herford. Thank you. And um, thank you so much for the presentation and uh, the Project list is substantial, and it was great to see so many of them um, uh, completed and well underway. So thank you so much for that. As we acquire more of these and, and build more of these facilities, I'm wondering about the, the maintenance piece. In the staff report, it says construction of new active transportation infrastructure creates additional maintenance requirements, such as snow plow for the, for the public works departments. Typically, this is addressed through an annual budget request from the public works department. And I was thinking about it's quite a bit different than how we handle our roads as far as an uh, annual um, budget for for maintenance and adding adding is great but also ensuring that we the ones that exist are properly maintained at what point do we start looking at it at um, our active transportation pieces um, particularly corridor trail as sort of its standalone piece and have annual um, maintenance budget for that, or is this an, or you see this not as an, uh, or a, a non-issue just seems to be dramatically different. Uh, through the chair, thank you for the question. Um, I wish I had a public works department employee with me right now to help answer it, but I'll do my best. Um, so it is absolutely an like critical consideration in all of this. And to date, we have been relying on the public works department to request what they need through the budget process to maintain the trails as they get built. Um, that works somewhat, I would say. Uh, we've been in conversation with them about the possibility of for when certain facilities or certain types of facilities get built, or when we get the budget approval to build those facilities to actually specifically ask for council support for the budget, which would then go into the budget process to maintain those. There are some types of facilities that will be more difficult to maintain or might require a certain uh, machine in particular to do that. And so we're going to try in the future to be more, to, to let council know uh, before the project's built that this is what the maintenance requirements will be. As far as um, using a process more like roads, I think I would need to discuss that with public works department and follow up with council. Thanks very much, Councillor Stoner. Thank you to the chair. Uh, that was one of my questions, um, especially because our budget line item has been fairly stagnant, I think, over the last five years that I've sat. It's like it's ebbed and flowed for sure, but um, the vast majority has come through the community works fund, uh, and I'm seeing eyebrows raised, so maybe not, but, um, I think my question is what has been the tax so the, uh, the amount of tax that has gone to the active transportation project, uh, over the last few years. Uh, so the chair, thank you for the questions. So we have to break out uh, construction. So capital versus maintenance. Uh, so for capital, as far as I know. Jesse can chime in if I get this wrong, but I don't think there's been any tax dollars gone to the capital side of this. This has all been funded through community works fund or grants or DCCs. Um, on the maintenance side though, that would be funded through tax and I do not know the amount, I apologize. 
That's all right. It would be helpful to know for the forthcoming budget, though, as we start to think about how we are actually uh, equitably distributing our tax income to various forms of transportation. Um, uh, and also, as we start to think about, great to know that the Community Works Fund is under renegotiation, but what that may or may not look like uh, in coming years. Um, a few other questions you mentioned, uh, we're kind of getting to a point where we're starting to think about an update to the active transportation plan, given where we're at at it. I'm just wondering if you have more of a timeline uh, that you're envisioning in your head when we might update this master plan. Uh, through the chair. So I don't have a timeline in mind, and we have been discussing this as part of the transportation master plans, the overall transportation plan. Uh, a lot of the, so we've done one round of engagement on that plan. A lot of feedback that we received was related to active transportation. So it could be that we get enough feedback through that process that we could then use it to update the active transportation plan. Um, or if we don't feel that that's adequate, we would, could then go back and plan it for a future year. So I, I don't have the answer to that question at this point, but I will have it at the end of the transportation master plan, plan process. Okay, it's great to know that we are getting that feedback. So I was gonna, that was gonna be my other question is how do we actually incorporate that in the broader transportation master plan? Um, there are a number of the projects on the list that are under the waiting category and they're waiting for a review of the neighborhood way program. I just wondering if you can speak to what that will entail and when that will happen. To the chair. Uh, so yes, we, so the active transportation plan recommended quite a number of neighborhood ways and they were seen to be kind of easy wins, you know, not too expensive to put into place. We have put in a number of them now. Um, we have gone back and done uh, traffic counter counts on them to look at speeds and volumes. Uh, we have found some reduction in speeds, but not to the point that it seems to really feel like a neighborhood way should uh, or be safe in the way that we want a neighborhood way to be. Um, our neighborhood ways also don't conform to the BC Active Transportation Infrastructure Guide, so they're a bit different than what is recommended. And so we have put a pause on implementing more of them until we have a better look at that and how we can make them better. Um, I don't have a timeline at this point for that uh, project, so uh, it's clearly needed, because you can see by looking at the, the list where it's needed. Um, it may be that through the transportation master plan, we have some great transportation engineers on that program. They may be able to make some recommendations that we could then attempt to implement, like one more as a pilot, for example, um, or we might need to do a whole separate project to, to look at them all together. Um, and tied into that, uh, but not specifically around active transportation, but still very uh, related is the work that's ongoing around speed reductions more broadly in the community. I'm just wondering if you can speak to that and how that ties in here as well. Uh, sure, through the chair. So I don't yet know what the outcome of that work is going to be. It will come to council and there will be a decision. So it's hard for me to tell you exactly how it's going to play in here, but there is a possibility of there being a speed limit reduction, for example, on all local roads or something along those lines, which would help to increase safety on the local roads. Um, we already have lower speeds on the neighborhood ways. So let's say we went to 40 on local roads, well, we're already at 30 on neighborhood ways. So it wouldn't really have much of an impact on neighborhood ways at all, but it could increase safety on all of our other local roads. Um, it's hard to say more without knowing what the outcome of that project will be. Um, all right, thank you for that. And then two other questions, if I can share. One is uh, just going back to the prioritization. And I realize that this is this; these are moving targets. There's lots of things that are feeding into it. I have two questions. One is, um, just as an example, so in the active transportation plan, government between Judd and Eagle Run, as well as Judd between the highway, sorry, depot, let me start over. Okay, so government road between Judd and Eagle Run, as well as depot road between the highway and government are both identified as short-term priorities. I'm just curious how we pick. So Depot Road is now in the budget for 24-25. Just curious, curious, we've received public input on both of those. They are both really challenging spaces. Um, and so I'm just curious how, like, how do we pick one over the other in that case? To the chair, um, that was a very difficult decision. Uh, the reason that Depot has ended up ahead of the government road one, uh, there's two reasons, three reasons perhaps. Uh, so on government, we're currently doing um, the AAA route study. So all ages and abilities route study, looking at where we can get an all ages and abilities route between downtown and Brackendale. So we aren't yet sure whether that might end up on government in that section or not. Um, so that's in process. 
Um, there is a sewer project that's needed on that section of government that um, is not in the sewer master plan. It's not quite yet. So we haven't reached it. And so it's a challenge to, we don't want to rejig the whole sewer master plan. Um, it gets very costly to do that. Um, and then lastly, in that section of government, there are some environmental issues that are significant as well that will require some lead time. So we felt that we could progress the depot ro uh, road project faster um, by starting it now and getting it underway. And then we'll follow up with government afterwards. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, and then my last question is in the list of considerations. One thing that I didn't see that is surprising to me is ICBC safety data. And so I'm just wondering how, so there's a feeling, a perception of safety on roads, and then there's like the hard data of where our actual biggest safety risk intersections are. And so how do we feed that into the decision process? To the chair. So we do have the ICBC data. We do look at this data. And when we're talking about active transportation specifically, there are not, there's not a lot of data about crashes that involve pedestrians and cyclists. Um, there are a few intersections that do stand out potentially. Uh, intersections are typically not an active transportation project. They fall more into a traffic kind of realm. And so they're not um, necessarily my responsibility to be working on those projects. Um, there's also just not a lot of data on those. So we do have a separate stream to look at um, traffic projects, so things like intersections, and that's where they would come up. Thanks very much. And Councillor Pettingill. Yeah, I just want to pick up on that the data is poor question. Is that because there aren't a lot of incidents uh, and therefore there's not a lot of data or is it because, you know, data collection is lacking and I don't know if that's an ICB thing or a, a RCMP thing or, or what? I'm just wondering, like, why? Through the chair, so uh, there there are not a lot of incidents reported to ICBC, but typically they're the more serious incidents where injuries might have occurred. Um, so any of the, something like a near miss, those are just not collected anywhere. Now it is possible to collect that kind of data with a you can install special cameras at intersections that look for near misses. Um, that's not something that we have done to date, though. Thanks very much. We've got a. Staff recommendation. Would anybody like to? Councillor French would like to move the staff recommendation that the District of Squamish receive the active transportation update report dated May 23rd, 2023 for information. Seconded by Mayor Herford. Would you like to speak to it? Thanks again for great work. Um, I, I learned more than a few things out of, um, the the report and uh it it's great to see that um there's an emphasis on short-term issues and we're also looking well into the future of what our community needs as, as it grows so thanks for a great report and councillor pettingill yeah just uh picking up on that last comment and, and happy to support this and, and all the great work that's being done we can't do it fast enough um but it's fantastic as, as stuff comes online uh i do sort of wonder like there's been that sign i think it's the rcmps that moves around and tells people about their their speed if a camera to do some better data collection i, I don't know if that makes sense and it's not something i want to dictate to bring to the budget but you know in all of our planning it, it does sort of make me wonder if if it's worth having a mechanism to validate some of the public commentary that we can move around and, and test. So anyway, so just leave that out there. Thank you. And Councillor Stoner. Thank you through the chair. I agree with my council colleagues comment that we can't do this work fast enough. I know there's a lot on your plate um, and I see all the work that's going on, but that list is still super long. Um, and I think if we actually are being serious about trying to get people into alternative forms of transportation, the idea of like moving this forward sooner rather than later is really critical. And so um, I would just like to put it out there to consider how, especially concerning that the Community Works Fund is under negotiation, um, what that impact might be on our budget to try and actually continue to move this work forward. Um, and so I'm not going to dictate putting this into the budget per se, but I would like to just generally make the comment that um, I think for me, the the pace at which this is going is not actually fast enough. And so I would actually entertain considering what we would need to put in the budget for additional staff, additional resources, so that we can move the active transportation work along uh, at a more rapid rate so that people can feel comfortable moving around our community uh, 
in different forms of transportation, um, whether that is bikes, rollerblades, buses, all the things. Um, so those are my comments. Thanks. Thanks very much. And with that, I will call the question. All those in favor? Thank you. Unanimous. Uh, that has passed. Thank you very much. Um, give me a brief moment. I've got a quick question. Okay. Thanks very much. So now we are on recess. Um, do we need to go to 1130? Yep. Recess until 1130.